again, everyone. Last time we surveyed a few reactions to the experience of crisis using examples that ranged over the entire 20th century. And taken as a whole, Bernstein would say there are examples of Charles Ives, Norris, Williams, Joyce, Ellison, Webern, and perhaps we should have also mentioned that the monthly journal of the NAACP, edited by W.E.B. Du Bois and founded in 1910, continues to be titled The Crisis. All of these, according to Bernstein, mark a general crisis and ambiguity, to use his term, where the structures of the past have collapsed or are collapsing and have not been replaced by any coherent ideological apparatus. Something had happened that all of these voices, in many ways so very different from each other, were reacting to. This can be mentioned alongside Michel Foucault and Gilles Deleuze's discussion of how regimes of sovereign power associate with feudalism gave way to disciplinary societies associated with industrialism and the bourgeoisie, and which are now being transformed into what they called societies of control, associated with networks, codes, surveillance, the postmodern, etc. You're no doubt familiar with one of the most famous markers of the collapse of the feudal sovereignty regime and the rise of the disciplinary society of enlightenment, but let's remind ourselves of it now. I'm 37. Uh, what? I'm 37. I'm not old. Well, I can't just call you man. Well, you could say Dennis. I didn't know you were called Dennis. Well, you didn't bother to find out, did you? I did say sorry about the old woman, but from behind you looked... What I object to is you automatically treat me like an inferior. Well, I am king. Oh, king, eh? Very nice. And how do you get that, eh? By exploiting the workers by hanging on to outdated imperialist dogma which perpetuates the economic and social differences in our society. If there's ever going to be any progress... Dennis, there's got... some lovely filth down here! Oh! How do you do? How do you do, good lady? I am Arthur, King of the Britons. <laughs> Whose castle is that? King of the who? The Britons. Who are the Britons? Well, we all are. We are all Britons. And I am your king. I didn't know we had a king. I thought we were an autonomous collective. You're fooling yourself. We're living in a dictatorship, a self-perpetuating autocracy in which the working classes... Oh, there get... you go, bringing class into it again. Well, that's what it's all about. If only people would... Please, hear... please, good people, I am in haste. Who lives in that castle? No one lives there. Then who is your lord? We don't have a lord. What? I told you, we're an anarcho-syndicalist commune. We take it in turns to act as a sort of executive officer for the week. Yes. But all the decisions of that officer have to be ratified at a special bi-weekly meeting. Yes, I see. By a simple majority in the case of purely internal affairs. Be quiet. But by a two-thirds majority in the case of more Be major... quiet. I order you to be quiet. Order? Who does he think he is? <laughs> I'm your king. Well, I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for kings. Well, how do you become king, then? The Lady of the Lake. Her arm, clad in the purest shimmering Samite, held aloft Excalibur from the bosom of the water, signifying by divine providence that I, Arthur, was to carry Excalibur. That is why I'm your king. Listen, strange women lying in ponds, distributing swords, is no basis for a system of government. Supreme executive power derives from a mandate from the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Be quiet! But you can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you. Shut up! I mean, if I went round saying I was an emperor just because some moistened bint had lobbed a scimitar at me, they'd put me away. Shut up! Will you shut up? Ah, now we see the violence inherent in the system. Shut up! Oh, come and see the violence inherent in the system! Help, help! I'm being repressed, bloody peasant! Oh, what a giveaway. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, eh? That's what I'm on about. Do you see him repressing me? You saw it? Deleuze and Foucault could not have said it better, but here is how Deleuze concisely describes these social transformations. 
Foucault located the disciplinary societies in the 18th and 19th centuries. They reach their height at the onset of the 20th. They initiate the organization of vast spaces of enclosure. The individual never ceases passing from one closed environment to another, each having its own laws. First the family, then the school, you are no longer in your family, then the barracks, you are no longer at your school, then the factory, from time to time the hospital, possibly the prison, the preeminent instance of the enclosed environment. It is the prison that serves as the analogical model. At, sight, at the sight of some laborers, the heroine of Rossellini's Europa 51 could exclaim, I thought I was seeing convicts. Guardi un po', c'è una persona... Per lei. Permesso? Per lei, signore. Buongiorno. Ho portato quella roba. Oh, Gesù, ti dico. Tenga. Questo ti basterà per i medicinali e per le spese... Foucault has brilliantly analyzed the ideal project of these environments of enclosure, particularly visible within the factory, to concentrate, to distribute in space, to order in time, to compose a productive force within the dimension of space-time, whose effect will be greater than the sum of its component forces. But what Foucault recognized as well was the transience of this model. It succeeded that of the societies of sovereignty, the goal and functions of which were something quite different, to tax rather than to organize production, to rule on death rather than to administer life. The transition took place over time. In their turn, the disciplines underwent a crisis to the benefit of new forces that were gradually instituted and which accelerated after World War II. A disciplinary society was what we already no longer were and what we had ceased to be. 
Elsewhere, he and others will make the point that it was Kafka who represented the breakdown of the disciplinary society and the coming of new forms of social control in his works The Trial and The Penal Colony in particular. But others were notable in this regard, including Jorge Luis Borges and William S. Burroughs. Get it out of your head and into the machines. Stop talking. Stop arguing. Let the machines talk and argue. A tape recorder is an externalized section of the human nervous system. You can find out more about the nervous system and gain more control over your reaction by using a tape recorder than you could find out sitting 20 years in the lotus position. Whatever your problem is, just throw it into the machines and let them chew it around a while. The soundtrack conjures up the image track. Word came before image. Shut off the soundtrack on your TV set and put in your own soundtrack. Words, music, what you will. Now, play back your soundtrack and you will see the images sharp and clear. Record soundtracks off TV and film programs. Mix in suggestions from rewrites to microphones and radio cruise cars. Press a button and record all sounds and voices of the city. Press a button to feed back these sounds with cut-ins a few seconds later. Rub out the word. There is no one there to hear it. Web? The vacant courage to let all messages in and out. To the mountain wind, loud and clear now. Through faulty human equipment hustling myself. Your stale overcoat not taking any dirty pictures. Twisting hole in everybody. Spilling out limestone, John Hamburger, Mary Jackie, Blue Note. Had enough movies. No good, no bueno. By now, All right, you have so we have an inside into the control machine. What happened how it to the 6D? How newspapers speak news. You will hear the disembodied voice, which speaks through any newspaper on lines of association and juxtaposition. The mechanism has no voice of its own and can talk indirectly only through the words of others. Speaking through comic strips, news items, advertisements, talking, talking above, above all. all, through names and numbers. Numbers are repetition, and repetition is what produces events. Dead, Dead fingers, fingers talk. talk. With his last mooch, Nickel Burroughs sneaked off to the payphone and called the law of all the cheap, lousy tricks, Burroughs, to call the law on your old friends. Despite the declaration of a general social crisis, or at least the series of general crises that signal the demolition of bourgeois morality and social structures, of enlightenment notions of progress, of reason, and its accompanying bourgeois norms, despite all of these upheavals, Bernstein finds something solid and universal to hold on to, and that is the connection between music and language as uniquely human modes of expression. A key to Bernstein's interpretation of Ives and the very notion of crisis is, in his view, that music, like language, is natural and expressive of something that is universally and uniquely human, despite what may, what may seem like an infinite variety of musical sound. Bernstein explicitly links language and music as two aspects of the same phenomenon, and he derives this not only from his own immersion into music, but also from Noam Chomsky's theory of generative transformational grammar, especially the concepts of creativity and deep structures that Bernstein pulls from it. Sadly, Chomsky is not well known to many, despite his being perhaps the foremost American intellectual of the late 20th century. Chomsky's early work, Syntactic Structures, fundamentally changed the field of linguistics, bringing about what was actually referred to as the Chomskyan revolution in linguistics. Perhaps, perhaps paradoxically, his lack of coverage in the American media is the result of his being a public intellectual, a media and U.S. foreign policy critic, and an anarcho-syndicalist. I'll put some links to more information about Chomsky and the bibliography, including the documentary Manufacturing Consent, a production on Chomsky's life and work underwritten by the Canadian government. It opens with the filmmaker juxtaposing clips of Chomsky receiving all of the major international scientific awards 
um, with person on the street interviews where he asked the question, do you know who Noam Chomsky is? And no one does. But Bernstein wants to draw from Chomsky's linguistics work as evidence of, the, of a general quality of expressiveness that belongs, he says, only to music and language. We can sum up Chomsky's generative transformational grammar very briefly. A small set of structures in the human brain itself produce rules of language that are almost infinitely variable, generating transformations while remaining within the rules of grammar and syntax. It is because of the, this uniquely human capacity for language, Chomsky argues, that a sentence such as colorless green ideas sleep furiously is both completely expressive, that is meaningful or creative, but also nonsense. So from a simple set of rules that we are hardwired for, we can generate a near infinite variety of languages. Now, if the, the capacity for language is universal in humans, then, by the way, we can see how, for Chomsky, language operates politically as well. Language itself indicates that ideologies of supremacy of nation and race are nonsense. Language and music are the two things that make us human, and this is crucial for Bernstein in arguing that music can express the uniquely human crisis of the 20th century, which many now would say, if nothing else, is a crisis of humanism and in what it means to be human. Chomsky himself has always argued that language is uniquely human, that other species do not have a language because it is something shaped in the unique brains of our species. However, let me just say that for the most part, aside from some disputes, we now understand that music and language are not at all unique to humans. It, it's only that we humans get to define what language and music are and are not. Chomsky grounds his views in Descartes and rationalism in the philosophy of the Enlightenment, but not in its natural history. Darwin himself, coming out of that natural history tradition, argued that music is in fact natural to many animals, and that for humans, music came before language. And we'll address this issue in the third part of the lecture when I turn to the critique of what I've been saying here. So as Bernstein himself says, Ives unanswered question is not a metaphysical one of the perennial question of existence but about the centrality of music at a time when music is expressive of the long crisis of the 20th century. Linking language to music, to being human, and to changes in human society gives Bernstein a canvas on which to sketch the ways in which music is expressive of those social transformations. Since all human production in some way discloses to us the existence of that singular 20th century crisis, he finds, does it really matter which work we choose to analyze and critique? So ironically, here Bernstein, one of the, the, the last great conductors and great artists, uh, uh, a true modernist, moves actually closer to what becomes known later on as a postmodernist view. And this is that what is truly important in a work is beyond the mere intention of the creator artist, and that the importance of any single work of art it can be called in the question, and shouldn't it be when it can be replaced and substituted with any other? In fact, Bernstein dismisses Ives' own description of the unanswered question. Remember what he says about the silences of the Druids and what he calls typical Ives' cracker barrel humor in favor of his own focus on the composition's expression of the great social upheavals of the 20th century. So I think we can say that at the very least for Bernstein, the unanswered question is a question that is simultaneously musical, social, universal, and individual. But doesn't this also imply that we can no longer simply listen to Ives, Schoenberg, or Stravinsky without consciously knowing what was to come? That is, we can never just naively listen to or enjoy it. Only seven years after he wrote The Unanswered Question, we would embark on 80 years of almost uninterrupted hot and cold wars. One can no longer simply make beautiful music. 
All music must now be understood. Bernstein and Adorno will agree. No matter what its intention was, or the intention of its creator, all music must now be understood as expressing something about the social world in which it is embedded. It's impossible to hear Ives' silences of the Druids after the sounds of the trenches, the camps, the atomic bomb, and indeed Bernstein seems to imply that the Druids were silent because there were none left to speak. As Bernstein says in Lecture 5, the 20th century has been a badly written drama. Indeed, one wonders if Bernstein knew how close he had come to the view that Adorno summed up in the words, there can be no poetry after Auschwitz. Now, Bernstein and Adorno agree that music is expressive, but they differ on what precisely is being expressed. So let's pause and listen to some music by Bernstein and Adorno, composed during the period of the Second World War. And first we'll hear Bernstein's sonata for piano and clarinet, which was composed over 1941 and 42.
Already you can hear the mixture of serious and popular in Bernstein's music. For Bernstein, expression is a natural result of human existence, and this expression of universal feeling discloses to us the presence of the deep structures that unite us all as humans. And for Bernstein, and for Stravinsky for that matter, primitivism expressed this deep relation to nature, as we can see from the title of Bernstein's final lecture, which stands as his answer to Ives' question, and it's titled Music of the Earth. So now let's hear this invocation of the primitive in the first section of the Rite of Spring, which is similarly titled Adoration of the Earth.
Keeping in mind what you just heard, let me turn to Bernstein's target, Theodore Adorno, a sociologist and composer, but better known as a philosopher and as a key member of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory. In contrast to Bernstein's naive naturalism, Adorno argues that music expresses the structures of social relations, which are always relations of power and authority. If music expresses anything, it is that, along with taste, style, fashion, and popular culture, it expresses the everyday existence of the mechanisms of domination and authority that structures contemporary social relations. Crisis now takes on a different and more subtle meaning. 
Adorno proposes that the critical social analysis of music is the place to carry out fundamental sociological investigations into theory, domination, consumerism, and culture. He says this in the essay, The Problem of a New Type of Human Being. This essay dates from 1941, but has only been recently published for the first time in a collection titled The Current of Music. And current in the title refers to the flows and directions of music, but also to the electrical current that's powering the devices through which we listen to music now. So. The fact that music is still unexplored territory means that one finds far fewer rigid views here than in other fields, and that there are far fewer obstacles in the form of cliches to impede the posing of questions. Music is especially qualified as an especially good point of entry to do this because it shares fundamental characteristics with language, and like language is it is, it's, is clearly dominated by monopolistic centers, while at the same time, unlike language, it is not directly connected to the world of objects. However, the influence of this object world is palpable in the, all elements of musical language and its reception. Music truly is, to cite Schopenhauer's aesthetics, the world once again, but a model that can be used to study the defining characteristics of reality without having to discuss directly the content of that reality. As an aside, Walter Benjamin and Adorno carried on an important and lengthy dialogue on popular culture, revolution, and crisis. I chose to use the construct of Bernstein versus Adorno rather than Benjamin versus Adorno, because Benjamin and Adorno often talk past each other due to the importance of music and sound in Adorno's work versus its literal absence in the works of Benjamin. Benjamin writes to Adorno upon the death of Alban Berg. You know that when we talked about music, a field that is otherwise quite removed from my sphere of interest, it was only when his work was the subject of conversation that we reached the same intensity as when we discussed subjects in other fields. Specifically, you will no doubt still remember our conversation after the Wojciech performance, which is a very famous performance, which I might mention again later on. Now, Benjamin, from his messianic Marxism to his friendship with Paul Clay and ownership of Clay's New Angel, to his radio show Enlightenment for Children. Benjamin was always concerned with the meaning of the crisis and what he saw as the coming revolutionary transformation of bourgeois social relations. For example, Benjamin delivered the equivalent of Bernstein's Young People's Concerts via some 30 broadcasts on German radio from 1929 to 1932. The topics covered ancient and modern natural disasters and crises, from the eruption of Vesuvius that buried Pompeii and Herculaneum to the Great Lisbon Earthquake, which Candide writes about, which Voltaire writes about, sorry, and is Candide, to the massive flooding on the Mississippi in the U.S. that had occurred only a couple of years before his broadcast. Let's give Adorno a little equal time and hear three pieces by him. Uh, the first are three short piano pieces, the second three poems for an all-female choir, and the third are two orchestral songs for an unfinished opera that he was going to do, that I'll mention a little bit more about that after we've heard them.
Despite his own nod to the popular, especially in the last piece, which was to be part of an opera based on Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, one does not, I think, hear much of an interest in meeting the demands of a popular audience in Adorno's work, though it does sneak through in the fact that Adorno follows the style of his mentor Alban Berg, one can actually hear echoes of Berg's Lulu in those last pieces of Adorno's orchestral songs. Now again, let's keep in mind what we just heard while we consider Adorno's views on music as natural. Is music at all natural for Adorno? Well, yes and no. It depends on how we think about what is natural and how we think about nature. It is certainly true that for Adorno, music, especially popular music, is not natural or expressive of nature. One might say that at best, it is merely an ideological expression of our relationship to nature. I shouldn't say merely, it's an important ideological expression of our relationship to nature. So although it does connect human beings to natural aspects of themselves, it does so only to exploit those natural biological aspects of humans, or to provide our minds and bodies with relaxation and recreation so that we can be reproduced and return to work the next day. Music cannot be expressive of nature because that nature no longer exists. For Adorno, that former nature has been transformed, appropriated, and dominated by humans. You may know the phrase, like second nature. Well, Adorno takes that phrase actually quite seriously. Nature is now really second nature, indistinguishable and unimaginable apart from its domination by human social production. Any aspects of ourselves that are natural, the very aspects that Bernstein appeals to, are no less dominated than the nature we still think of as out there. For music expresses, or if music expresses a relation to nature, it is in fact expressing our relation to this second nature that is characterized by authority and domination and not freedom and choice. Perhaps we can hear this negative dialectical drift in and out come into view in a piece that Bernstein does not mention by Charles Ives, but which is a very interesting one called On the Antipodes, a short song by him.
pleasures nice and sweet as a little pamphlet. And sometimes it Nature's man's enemy, nature's man's friend. Nature shows us part of life. Another image of this second nature is Marx's argument that the world presents itself to us as a vast accumulation of commodities. And Adorno draws heavily on Marx's chapter on the fetishism of commodities to argue that music is no less commodified, that it is no more expressive than any other consumer item produced by the culture industry. This leads Adorno to take a very dismissive attitude towards the kind of popularization that Bernstein promoted through much of his work. And even the popular, socially meaningful music, such as anti-war music, that Bernstein embraced. Take a look at this short clip of Adorno speaking about protest music. Ich glaube allerdings, dass Versuche, Prote äh, politischen Protest mit der äh, Popular Music, also mit der Unterhaltungsmusik zusammenzubringen, äh, deshalb zum Scheitern verurteilt sind, weil die ganze Sphäre der Unterhaltungsmusik, auch wo sie irgendwie modernistisch sich aufputzt, so mit dem wahren Charakter, mit dem Amüsement, mit dem Vielen nach dem Konsum äh, verbunden ist, äh, dass also Versuche, dem eine verändert Funktion zu geben, ganz äußerlich bleiben. Und ich muss sagen, wenn also dann irgendjemand sich hinstellt äh, und auf eine im Grunde doch schnulzenhafte Musik dann irgendwelche Dinge darüber singt, dass Vietnam nicht zu ertragen sei, äh, dann finde ich, dass gerade dieser Song nicht zu ertragen ist, weil er, indem er das Entsetzliche noch irgendwie konsumierbar macht, schließlich auch daraus noch äh, etwas wie Konsumqualitäten heraus. Therefore, the idea that music expresses something other than social relations, that some music is authentic and others not, is absurd. The demand for authenticity or relevance is a demand for conformity that is regulated and imposed from both within and without. Even before the protest music of the 1960s emerged, Adorno had written that, Whoever says culture also says administration. The polemical and useless, namely the products of the culture industry. You let culture drive around in a kind of gypsy caravan, but this gypsy caravan moves in the midst of a monstrous hall. There are no hiding places. Culture has long been become questionable as it has become nothing more than the coagulated content of the educational privilege. In other words, a managed appendix integrated into the production process. One hears echoes of this view in John Schaefer's remarks when WNYC here in New York threatened to cancel his long-running show, New Sounds. Marginalization of the arts, with the big depressing news we're facing, is the exact opposite of what this culture needs. 
When what we listen to is all based on algorithms, you're fed things that will already fit your taste. The domination and intensification of consumer society, what Adorno calls the culture industry, continues relentlessly until it pervades every aspect of life. This means for Adorno that even the radicalism of musical atonality could not escape in the end the process of commodification. It even becomes kind of degraded form of pure dissonance, the norm of horror film soundtracks. Bernstein and Adorno converge on the importance of Stravinsky's nod to popular music, especially jazz. For Bernstein, though, this was to be applauded, while Adorno saw Stravinsky as embracing the culture industry, which he did not try to resist as Adorno thinks Schoenberg did, or at least Schoenberg did until late in his life when Schoenberg quote-unquote wanted to be heard by wider publics, the kinds of publics that Kurt Weill and Stravinsky himself were commanding at the time. But Adorno and Bernstein converge in another important way. They both believe that music is expressive of social life, but here again they diverge almost immediately. If Bernstein is right about Ives, that he is asking a question about not only the direction of music, but also of a civilization on the brink of a catastrophic world war, then it holds equally true that Stravinsky's right of spring expresses the coming crisis, with its industrialization of killing that only civilized people, and certainly not any primitives, can dream of. Here's Adorno on Stravinsky's right of spring. The right of spring makes the subject of the work a human sacrifice, that of the principal dancer, a sacrifice which the music not so much interprets as ritualistically accompanies. The right consists of rigid and convulsive blows and shocks that reproduce the machines and technocratic domination that we see also in Fritz Lang's Metropolis. His percussive effects are no less than assassination attempts, echoes of archaic war drums, blows of the sort that sacrificial victims and slaves have to endure. The anti-humanistic sacrifice to the collective, sacrifice without tragedy, made not in the name of a renewed image of man, but only in the blind affirmation of a situation recognized by the victim. This insight can find expression either through self-mockery or through self-annihilation. Speaking of the prehistoric youth generation of the right, Cocteau stated in somewhat condescending but well-intentioned tones of enlightenment, these credulous men imagine that the sacrifice of a young girl chosen above all others is absolutely essential to the rebirth of spring. So for Adorno, Stravinsky's right of spring and its primitivism show, like the paintings of Emile Nolde, that this naive primitivism is not so naive and harmless as we might pretend it is, nor is it really any type of threat to the bourgeois social order. Like Nolde's paintings, Stravinsky represents nature in terms of the primitive and the savage. For Adorno, it does not express the freedom or the so-called back-to-nature ideology that it claims. Adorno argues that this is not nature, but really the expression of that second nature, with the pleasures and desires, brutality and domination that we find in the Marquis de Sade's Justine, or in William Blake's Dark Satanic Mills. Stravinsky, therefore, has more in common with Emil Nolde than he does with Schoenberg. Not all expression is the same. Nolde was a member of the Nazi party from its first days and remained a committed Nazi until the end. His work was still banned because of its primitivism and its expressionism, which were, according to the Nazi authorities, degenerate. They actually put a guard outside his studio so he could not paint, so he only did watercolors in the last part of his life. 
A similar and significant contrast can be drawn between Stravinsky's right and Alban Berg's opera Lulu. Stravinsky naturalizes the violence and terror of the present by connecting it to a mythological ritualistic past, whereas Alban Berg's Lulu makes it clear that the violence and objectification found in that work of art are those found in the production of contemporary everyday life. Lulu describes social life without naturalizing it. I will let Adorno have the last word on what he sees as the contrast to be drawn between the two. To intellectual reflection, to taste that considers itself able to judge the matter from above, Stravinsky's Renard may well seem a more suitable treatment of Wundekind's Lulu than does Berg's music. The musician knows, however, how far superior Berg's work is to Stravinsky's, and in its favor it willingly sacrifices the sovereignty of a, the aesthetic standpoint. Artistic experience is born out of such conflicts. Sensual satisfaction, punished at various times by an ascetic authoritarianism, has historically become directly antagonistic to our art. Mellifluous sounds, harmonious colors, and suaveness have become kitsch and trademarks of the culture industry. The sensual appeal of art continues to be legitimate only when, as in Berg's Lulu or in the work of André Maisson, it is the bearer or a function of the content rather than an end in itself. The question is whether the crisis or crises of the 20th and 21st centuries will become normalized and naturalized, or be resolved through social reform, or through the type of catastrophe of a revolt of nature that Horkheimer talked about. Ives's silences of the Druids could be the silences of extinction documented by Bernie Krauss and his comrades. So, all right, that's enough for now. We'll be back next time to discuss a critique of the original version of these notes, as well as the critiques in your comments that you've sent along to me. And as they used to say back in South Carolina, we'll see each other again if the sun comes up and the creek don't rise.